Uh, thank you all for coming today. We're very thankful to our uh, presenter today to come and uh, um, talk to us about this important topic. Uh, so join me in uh, welcoming Professor Joyce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you again. I suppose this will be the last year. I still see people I know, and the rest of you, <laughs> who's he? <laughs> um, you, wanted, you asked me to talk about the pastor's devotional life, and that's such a personal thing that I'm kind of reluctant to do it. Uh, and, in a way, and in a way, it's especially difficult to do it for you, because y you now are coming in your seminary years <clears throat> to years when um, uh, your whole day is spent being fed. And so as a sense that you need a personal devotional life probably isn't real strong at the moment, and understandably so. You, have, you, you are fed with the Word of God in every class, and you are fed with the Word of God in worship, and, and in a hundred other ways. And Well, how much more state can you take? Um, uh, but uh, the days are coming when you won't be fed anymore, when you'll do the feeding. And so if you don't feel a particular... A particular need, it be, you should. I mean, you should have a private devotional life. Now, I certainly did when I was your age. Um, <laughs> when I was your age. Um, uh, then if, if you don't feel that particular drang uh, at the moment, then file away what I'm saying in the back of your head and pull it out after six months in the ministry, and you'll look at the subject very, very much differently. And, and so, basically, uh, you already have the outline in and maybe in true seminary fashion, you haven't bothered to look at it. Um, yeah, I, some things just don't change. Uh, basically, I'll, I want to talk to you, first of all, about the obstacles uh, to a devotional life and the consequences of those obstacles, and then um, discuss just what a pastor's devotional life might consist of, and then at the very end, tell you again, with even greater reluctance, what my own consists of, not because I think that's the right way to do it, but just to give you uh, an example of how somebody does it. So, <clears throat> the pastor's devotional life, obstacles and consequences, the obstacles, in a sense, are the same as those that confront any Christian, but that are heightened in the life of a pastor. The devil, the world, and your own sinful flesh will tell you that you're too busy, too busy doing the Lord's work. You just don't have time for any private, meaningful private devotional life. Besides that, you're always in the Word anyway. I mean, you're going to be busy. Uh, at least you ought to be. If you're not, there's something wrong with you, very wrong with you. There's so much to do in the ministry. No two days are alike. There is simply no possibility of getting bored or ever finding it um, uninteresting. It is an absolutely fascinating life. Uh, you, you will plan things for a day, and then you will find at the end of the day that you didn't get to any of them because people got in the way uh, with their needs and, and things, that you, things that, you, um, uh, that, that you will want to do for them that you couldn't possibly have, have scheduled. And so one of the first things that you're going to do in the ministry is look for time savers. Look for a way to save time. You heard at the seminary that you should have a private devotional life, and so when you got out, you did uh, but now you're so busy, you're so busy, and, and you've got to find some way to save time. And, and the simplest thing to cut out is a private devotional life. Who knows, you might get 10 minutes extra that way. Um, uh, uh, the, the sad fact of the matter is you'll find if you cut out your devotional life, you won't gain a single second. Um, if anything, your day will be more bogged down than it was already. Uh, you won't save time. And you will have fallen for a clever trick of the devil, a very, very clever trick of the devil. Uh, what do you need with a private devotional life? For Pete's sake, you're writing a sermon every week. Um, and so you're in the Word. You're preparing Bible class every week. You've got sick calls and shut-in calls, and you prepare devotion for them every week. And then you've got your wife and the little piranhas around your table, and you, and you read little visits with God. Um, and so, and so you're, you're always in the Word. You don't need a private devotional life. Yeah, but you do. Yeah, but you do. Because your needs as a pastor are, uh, in a sense, as compared to your family and your members, your needs as a pastor are unique. Um, are you, when you cut out your devotional life, are you aware of that? Are you aware of the temptation specific to the pastoral office that require the lash of the law 
and the salve of the gospel. Read the prophets and note how much of their rebuke and encouragement that should be in a Teufels in der Schreibmaschine is directed exclusively to prophets and priests. Um, the lash of the law and the salve of the gospel in the ministry. There are some people uh, in your congregation who will think, well, you're just the greatest thing since life sliced bread. Why, pastor, you're so much better than the schlunkel that we had before. He screwed everything up and ticked people off this way, that way, and the other way, and oh, we're so happy to have you. You're just so wonderful. And of course, you'll be stupid enough to believe it and come to think that you are the brightest crown and the jewel of Holy Mother Church. And then with the passing of time, somebody else will come along and ask why you still cumber the ground because you do nothing but screw up. We're not going to raise your salary. You didn't get any more members in. Um, and, and drag you down so that instead of thinking that you're the brightest jewel in the crown of Holy Mother Church, you will <laughs> rather think that maybe you are a poop on the sole of her foot uh, instead. Uh, as with all of life, we tend to go from the two extremes of carnal security to despair and spend only as much time in the middle as is needed to get to the opposite end. And that's true in the life of the pastor too. You're going to be dealing with people and that's messy business. You know, you have enough difficulty getting along with one another at times. When your background is the same, your ideals are the same, your focus and your goals are the same, well, if it's messy dealing with one another, you simply can't imagine how messy it's going to be dealing with that whole range of people in a congregation uh, from the one, I remember a man in my first congregation, um, uh, seven kids, and each one broke the mold. Uh, and they, they, he sat in front with that tribe of Arabs of his. And, and, he, and they, they came by it naturally. He was a stinker, but he wouldn't miss church on a bat. And you could read that man's face when you were preaching. Yeah, Reverend, you tell us how it's supposed to be. And Reverend, see to it that you do it. That's why we got you here. Um, you don't expect me to. Um, uh, I remember his kid got in an accident, 16 years old, uh, drunk driving, and he was in the hospital. And I went to visit him in the hospital with maybe not as much gospel as I otherwise would have had. And his father came to see me and he said, yeah, Reverend, we got to clamp down on these kids. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I said, well, he was, this, this accident was 3 o'clock in the morning. What in the world is he doing out at 3 o'clock in the morning? Never mind the fact that he's drunk. Um, uh, uh, he, he ought to be home by 11 o'clock. That's right, Reverend. We got to have a curfew. We got to have them all home at 11 o'clock. And I said, that, of course, means you have to be home then, too to see to what that he is. He skipped church for two weeks. He was so ticked at me. Um, you're dealing with people. You're going to have the one end of the extreme, people who know nothing and want to know nothing, um, and you're going to have people who are just, just, just wonderful, um, that know their Bible and love their Bible and are devoted to the church and devoted to their pastors uh, and everything in between. And it's messy. It's just messy. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to you, you you're you're going to screw up. Um, when I was a vicar, I remember, and some of it. I mean, I could tell you stories all day about uh, things that I did that were real screw ups, but I'm not going to do that. I'll just tell you about some minor things that just give you an idea of how unpredictable um, people are in their reaction to even your best efforts. When I was a vicar, went to see a man. I don't know, 150 years old, something like that. He was really old. This was in. In, in Marlette, Michigan, and, and um, not from a real faithful family, and he was a shut-in. He was being taken care of by his daughter, and he was not well and not expected to live all that long, and so I went to, I went to see him and had a devotion with him. I don't remember what the devotion was, but I mentioned the angels. I mentioned the angels. And in what context, again, I don't recall um, anymore. That was a long time ago, but his... his uh, family called and said, uh, uh, our father does not want you ever to come back again. Well, why not? You mentioned the angels and that made him think of death and he doesn't want to think about death. Well, he should have been thinking about death. He was awfully close to it. Well, what do you do with something like that? Um, I, didn't, I didn't intend to be the reason why he slammed the door on the gospel. Or just yesterday at St. Mark's, where I'm a member in Watertown, they have a uh, the parochial school has a, uh, about a half an hour service every week, and 
and um, once a year they asked me to, to preach for it, and yesterday was my turn. And, and they gave me the text that was Josiah. They wanted me to talk about Josiah uh, and, and, and in Second Chronicles 34. And, and so I talked about Josiah as the, 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 the theme was Josiah was different. He was different and he made a difference. And in, in the introductory remarks to how he was different made a difference, I mentioned that, I mentioned that his, um, his father was a, a terrible unbeliever and done awful things, and his grandfather was even worse. He had uh, uh, killed the prophet Isaiah by having him sawed in half. pastor came up to me after the devotion and said, we have a boy in eighth grade whose name is Josiah. His father is in jail, and his grandfather isn't any better. <laughs> I'm supposed to anticipate that somehow. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I don't know if that I'll find out later when I talk to my pastor. I'll ask him about it. If the boy was upset or edified, could have been either. You know, um, people are messy. People are just simply messy, and and uh, and and you will often need as a pastor the special lash of the law when you just get too full of yourself, and you will, um, on some rare occasions maybe, um, and, and you'll certainly need even more than that, the salve of the gospel when you are wondering how in the world, and, and the older you get, the more you'll wonder that. Um, uh, you, you wonder what in the world the Lord ever had in his mind uh, when he let you into the ministry, um, that you just seem to be uh, uh, just a screw up, and the, the amazing thing i uh, just give you a little little clue with the passing of a few years, you may very well discover that the weaknesses that you have um, are the things that have uh, that will prove to be most useful in the ministry because they make you human and keep you on your knees at the foot of the cross, not your strengths, not your strengths well you write that down the back of your head, Tifo, and uh, get back to me. Playing pretty and knowing one wine from another um, <laughs> isn't what's going to make it for you. I can tell you what will, uh, but not, not here, not now, yeah? <laughs> um, so, so you're, you're, and again, when you read the prophets, when you read the prophets, see how much of, to, how much of the time is devoted uh, to um, speaking to other prophets and priests. God will hold you to a higher standard. And you will need more from his word than anybody else because he holds you to a higher standard. <laughs> Jesus said, to whom much is given from him, much is required. Um, uh, think, for example, just two examples, Moses. Uh, Moses leads the children of Israel for 40 years. And... Um, while those who left Egypt with those rare exceptions didn't get into the promised land, their children, who were only, um, by comparison, a little bit better, got into the promised land and Moses didn't. Why not? Why not? He didn't do such a terrible thing. He struck a stone instead of speaking to it. Big whoop. Compared to what everybody else had done, God held him to a higher standard. Um, because he had not given an example of faithful, consistent, and constant obedience to the word of the Lord. Or that prophet, we don't even know his name, uh, who God sent up to rebuke Jeroboam. Remember him? Uh, he goes up and, he re and told them, you go straight up, you come straight back to Judea from, from Samaria, and, and, and do not pass go, do not collect 200, uh, straight back. So he went up and he rebuked Jeroboam very effectively, very powerfully. And Jeroboam lived. On his way back, you remember, the son of, the, son of a prophet said, well, we have a word from the Lord that you should turn aside and come have supper with us. And so he did. And, and, well, but he disobeyed. Such a little thing. Uh, and, and so he was devoured by, was killed by lions. Um, on his way back because he didn't obey the word of the Lord. Too much is given from him, much will be required. Much has been given to you, much is being given to you now. And the temptations of the devil to take it away not only from you but from the blood-bought souls entrusted to your care 
will be great and you won't always see them coming. And like I say, just the simple fact that you're dealing with people is messy. Um, you will make mistakes. Uh, and some of them in innocence, some of them completely in innocence. And some of the mistakes you will make will be because you knew what the right thing was to do, but you said to yourself, well, in this circumstance, this is an exception. I could tell you horror stories about that. Um, this is an exception. No, it isn't. But you won't find that out until after you've made a mess out of it. Um, so so uh, you will need the lash of the law, and you will need the salve of the gospel. Uh, by your own lack of a devotional life, do you fall into, fall into the habit of making exegesis generic in general and thus preaching and teaching mere, mere cliché? What you're going to find out is if you try to save time by cutting out a devotional life, the next thing that's going to go is a good, solid text study for your sermons because you're always going to have more to do than you can get done. And you're always going to be thinking of ways that you can save time that nobody <laughs> will notice. And you may very well convince yourself that nobody has noticed that your devotional life is absent, even though you tell them they ought to have one. Um, <clears throat> and, you, and you come to the conclusion, well, these people don't know as much as I thought, and they don't really expect all that much, and so I won't do a solid text study because I can save 10 hours a week that way. Yeah? Uh, if I don't do a solid text study, if I don't read my Greek, if I don't read my Hebrew, or the original German, as the case may be. Um, uh, and then, and then, and then what happens is that your sermons will become cliches and your text, your exegesis of text will be generic. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, uh, you, let, you've got, you've got um, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not charging their trespasses to them. Oh, that's about forgiveness. So I'll tell them all about forgiveness, which you told them last Sunday. When you had the text, Ye das Lamb Gottes, das der Welt sind der Trichts. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the... Well, that's about forgiveness. And then maybe a few, maybe a few months down the pike, you'll have, uh, you'll have the Hebrews text, We have this great high priest who has entered into the uh, temple not made with hands. <coughs> oh, that's about forgiveness. Uh, Reformation Day rolls around, so you have text from Romans, I suppose. Oh, oh, that's about forgiveness. Preach the same sermon every time. And completely miss that, yes, all those texts are about forgiveness. And each one of those texts is unique. Each one of those texts presents the facts of our salvation differently. Um, when you, when, when, when you, 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 you don't do a good exegesis of the text, you rush to the bottom line for, the, for its doctrinal summary, and you don't get, you don't, you don't give people an opportunity to see the beauty of the scriptures and the wondrous way that God has in his word of nailing down a truth by never repeating it, but by presenting it in such a rich, rich varieties of, variety of, of ways. I mean, you're preaching on an Old Testament text um, and it talks about sin. And so you tell them everything you know about sin. Well, when the Old Testament is... Um, uh, when, uh, especially in the Psalms, when the Old Te Testament passages talk about sin, there are five different ways, four or five different ways in which sin is viewed. Sometimes it's viewed as a debt that has to be paid. Sometimes it's viewed as something that has to be punished. Sometimes it's viewed as something that God takes very personally. Um, I remember Jeremiah 31, 31 always springs to mind uh, Professor Eichmann um, while he was still living, he hasn't, we haven't done much together since he died. Um, <laughs> while he was still living, gave me a, gave me a translation, a German translation of the Bible that he used when he was in at, at the university in Germany. And um, I can't. I, I was looking for it I, a couple of weeks ago, and I couldn't find it. I know what I did with it. I must have lent it to somebody. Big mistake, lending things from your library. You never see them again. Anyway. Um, um, it's a really good translation. It, it's it's by a, it's not Luther's translation. It's a, by a Jewish convert from the I think the late nineteenth century, and in Jeremiah thirty one he had an interesting way of translating, Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. Sie haben böses getan, um mich zu erzürnen, um 
mich zu erzürnen. German scholars, um zu, what kind of clause? Purpose clause, purpose clause. They have done wickedness just to tick me off. And be a good translation of um mich zu erzürnen. In order to tick me off. Well, you, th you sit there and you think about it. Well, this talks about sin. Sometimes sin is bad and, and you shouldn't sin because God is. And then Jesus loves me, this I know, and he forgives me and blah, blah, blah. Um, amen. <laughs> um, but that passage is so rich. God takes it all so personally. Well, you think about that. You chew on that for a while. When I sin and when other people sin, they're not thinking about God at all. They're thinking about what they want to do at the moment. But God takes it personally. Well, hey, it's kind of neat to think about it that way. Not every passage in the Bible speaks of it that way. Um, Psalm 51 makes a distinction between iniquity, sin, and transgression. That's a big distinction in the Old Testament. Um, well, what is it? How are they different? Huh? Uh, in your own, and that kind of gets me ahead to what I want to talk about more a little bit later on, and, and give you maybe a few examples uh, a little bit later on. When you read the Bible in your own devotional life, you ask the same questions of it that you ask when you do an exegesis. And the fact that you do it every day f just for yourself trains your mind, gives you a habitus that will always be asking those questions when you're preparing devotions for the hospital or when you're preparing Bible class. A lot of people complain about nobody goes to Bible class. Sometimes there's a good reason for that. Um, 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 you ask yourself again to get ahead of myself what does this passage say that's unique everything that you read in the Bible every section that you read in the Bible is unique there's something about it that you're not going to find in any other place of the, in the Bible and you haven't read it until you found that out um haven't finished with it. That may take you a long time. It may take you several years, several readings. And in point of fact, you're going to discover with the passing of time, if you're faithful in conducting your devotions and in doing text study, you're going to find out that there are always all kinds of things that are unique in a text that you didn't see, that you didn't note before. You're always digging a deeper well. Um, the, other, the other question that you, that you ask is, of all the things... <coughs> Of all the things that God could have had recorded in his word, this is especially true of Old Testament Bible history, but it's true in the New Testament and the Gospels as well, as St. John says uh, in chapter 20. Of all the things that could have been recorded, why was this recorded? Well, the answer to the question, of course, is this was recorded because it had some eternal relevance. It had some eternal significance for the one who was reading it. Uh, and, so, and so you ask, what does this passage, what does this story, whatever it is you're reading, what does it have to say to me in my office as a pastor? How does God address me, his pastor? How does God address me, a husband? How does God address me, a father? Uh, <laughs> if it's Bible history, how am I, how is our, especially read the book of Judges, um, um, e each one of the judges comes out of a certain cultural milieu that has points of comparison with the world in which you live. What are they? The, the man that's being talked about, the particular judge that's being talked about, has a mix of strengths and weaknesses. How is he like me? How did God deal with him? Can I expect that he will deal with me the same way in the law and in the gospel. Um, you, you, um, all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, and that's kind of related to, have you forgotten that the Lord balances burdens and blessings, that the ferocity of the devil's temptations come in proportion to the measure of God's gifts and graces, and thus your correspondingly greater need, you've forgotten that, your correspondingly greater need of his strength from the word and the sacraments, uh, you will get to see, because of the gifts and graces that God has given you in your years of study, 
and in your continuing study once you're out, you will get to see the interesting ways, the absolutely fascinating ways, in which God stirs his finger in the soup of human affairs. Um, um, and, and, and then how he stirs his finger in the soup of your own life to accomplish his good and gracious will. The hurricane goes through. The tornado whips a path through the community. Uh, somebody dies in the silo. Um, uh, and somebody else is killed in a terrible accident. A child is born with incurable birth defects that, that aren't going to kill him, but that are going to tie up his family in knots for the next who knows not how many years. Why? Why? Why does God let these things happen? Uh, and you will, you will get to see how God uses you to strengthen people in those circumstances, in those situations, and you will get to make the comparison of how other people who turn their back on the gospel are completely done in by the same circumstance. Um, you will see, you will see in your own life. And so you, there's endless opportunities to, to apply whatever it is that you're reading in your private devotions. You will see in your own life how God mixes and matches the blessings with the burdens. Uh, you, 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 will, you will have times when you will wonder, had they told me these things at the seminary, um, I, I would have headed out on the next moon mission. Um, and and, and then, you will, then you will discover how God, how God arranges some little thing, some little thing just for you, just to pick you up and set you off on your way again and let you know that he hasn't forgotten about you, that, he, that generally speaking he knows what he's doing even without your advice. A great, great insight there. Yes, it is. Um, I remember when I was in Canada, uh, see I'm old, I get to tell stories. Um, when I was in Canada, it was, it was a rough, rough situation. I take way too long to tell you how rough it was. And um, one, one, uh, one day, the, the kids were getting ready for a Christmas program, pr planning a Christmas program. And I never had much time to spend with the Sunday school. I'd meet with the teachers and, and tell them everything I knew about the story and then encourage them to figure out how they're going to apply that to a, to a six-year-old because they could do it better than I could. Um, so I, I really didn't, this, the service schedule and all this and that, and Bible class and all this, and I really didn't get much chance to go back there and look at things myself. Well, anyway, they were getting ready for the Christmas program, and the Sunday school teachers came and said, have you heard this story before? I told you this story before. Or was I just spitting in the wind? And they just, uh, mm -hmm. um, um, would, would, you, uh, would, would you let the children have a dress rehearsal Sunday morning instead of Bible class, just for you, Pastor? Kids really want to do that just for you, Pastor. Yeah, okay. So um, I said that'd be fine. So the church was over, and I was all gussied up in my robe and everything. And I sat down, and the kids came in, and each one had their little piece. And small mission, fairly small mission congregation at the time, of a sort of a mini United Nations. We had everybody there, and this one little German girl, Christina, cute as a button. Um, I think she must have been about in fourth grade. She got up to say her piece and she forgot it. And she started to cry. And I was sitting, the church is kind of, you know, altars here and the pews are like this. I was sitting here and the kids were over here. And so I just said, Christina, come mal her. And so <laughs> she came over and I picked her up and I sat her on my lap. So she couldn't do that anymore these days. But sat her down on my lap and I, I said, I said, Christina, heute Nachmittags wird alles vollkommen sein. This afternoon it'll be perfect. Yeah, Herr Pastor. Yeah. Und wie weißt du denn das, Herr Pastor? Ich bin Pastor. <laughs> and so of course I sweat bullets for the rest of the day. Um, and, 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 that, and that afternoon then when they had the program, Christina was perfect. She was letter perfect. And when the, when the program was over and the kids were coming out of church, 
she just ran at me and I grabbed her up and scooped her up in my arms and she said, Hepesta, du hast recht, du hast vollkommen recht, you were right, you were completely right. But naturally, she's been pissed off. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I remember, I remember in a very, very difficult life, uh, they're walking across the, the, this was in a cul-de-sac and the parsonage was on the other side of the cul-de-sac. I remember after everybody had gone home, um, walking across uh, to the parsonage and just looking, it was snowing, it was very cold, bitterly cold, and, and looking up into the sky and just saying, you did that just for me, didn't you? Some little thing, you know. Somebody will come over. The, the little old lady, a spinster in, in South Dakota, uh, very shy, very bashful, and when she made uh, pie, p apple pie and homemade bread in the summertime, she would sneak up to the parsonage and look in the garage window to see if I was home. And after she had and if I would catch sight of her, I knew I wasn't going anywhere for a while because when she was through, she would come over with a loaf of bread just out of the oven and an apple pie and said, Pastor, I made this just for you. Well, isn't that nice? As compared to the woman whose daughter um, couldn't memorize the first commandment if her life depended on it. She had all kinds of problems and I suggested she should not be should confirmed. She should wait and be instructed as an adult. And her banshee of a mother comes flying at me. Um, no wonder all the kids hate you. Well, they, I didn't think they did. Uh, so, but it hurt. It hurt. And I couldn't get it through her head that I was doing this for the benefit of her daughter. Uh, that she wouldn't be subjected to this difficulty, which was way past her ability to deal with it. She couldn't get that through her head. Or you go to the you go to the um, to the jail to help bail out Junior, and you think to yourself, "Well, now I've really got this family is going to be in my corner, and never have to worry about them again." Au contraire, it's embarrassing to them that you know about it at all. Um, so dealing with people is going to be messy and there are going to be a lot of things that happen that are just put you on cloud nine and there are going to be a lot of things that happen to you that just drive you to despair. And, and the only thing that's going to keep you going is not the people who put you on cloud nine, but <coughs> the word of God, the gospel and the word and the sacraments. As you day by day by day find your center not in the people who put you on cloud nine and not in the ones who drive you to despair, but in Christ. That's what, that's what, that's what your goal always has been. And, and when you're not being fed anymore, but doing all of the feeding, well, you're going to have to be sure to take some time to feed yourself or you're going to starve. The consequences are both personal and professional if you neglect uh, devotional life. Very easily the ministry degenerates into professionalism. It's a job. <clears throat> Devoid of the joyful awareness that Christ loves even pastors. Preached a sermon on that one time. Can even pastors be saved? Um, sheep come to be seen as goats and a bother. Members as means to an end of self-fulfillment, support, and satisfaction rather than those whom Christ pursues with a passion. See, that's what you notice in your own devotion. That Christ pursues with a passion, you, in the word and the sacraments. You, even you, especially you. Um, notice in the Gospels, for example, how often, how often Jesus switches from a plural to a singular. Um, uh, yeah, now I had a good example in mind. Uh, the one who comes to me, I will not cast out that one. Um, or, of course, that if any one wants to follow me, he must take up his cross uh, and come after me, deny himself and come after me, <coughs> deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, in the singular, that he's always addressing individuals, um, not just groups, not just a blob of humanity. I, in my own devotions, I very often like to think that Jesus is sitting just off to the side <coughs> and that he has nothing better to do in this hour than spend it with me. And I certainly have nothing better to do in this hour 
then spend it with him. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so you've got to get this done and you've got to get that done. There's so much, so much, so much, so much um, that, again, if you've neglected your devotional life and that's followed by neglecting good sound text study so that your sermons are becoming cliches, then you just suck the living life and breath out of the ministry and just become busy. And then it's real easy. It, and, and this happens, you know, it's just like the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, the story of David and Bathsheba, David didn't get up one morning and say to himself, well, let's see, today would be a good day to commit adultery, and then tomorrow I'll have the husband murdered, and then I think I better hide out from church for a year. That's not how it happened. It happened by inches. Uh, the most important verse in the story is the first verse. It was the time when the kings went out to war. David didn't do his duty. He stayed home. He made a little compromise. That's how you find it for yourself as well. In fact, you're old enough by now to have figured that out. That falls don't come in one fell swoop. They come by inches. A little compromise here, a little compromise there, begets another compromise, and then another compromise, and then another compromise. Uh, and it's always harder. The line keeps moving down, down, down. And it's always harder to get back up past that line as it goes down. And you'll find that in your own personal life. If you, you should, like I say, you should have figured that out by now. You're old enough to have figured it out by now. And you'll find it true in your life as a pastor as well. Um, pretty soon, pretty soon, if it's just a job and people are more of a bother than an opportunity to serve Christ as well as them, then, well, delinquent calls are so frustrating. I can, there are plenty of other things I can do besides make delinquent calls. I'll fix up my web page. You know. um, or I'll go visit somebody that I know likes me. Won't make a delinquent call. Evangelism calls can sometimes be rough. And so, well, maybe we better send the elders there first, and then we'll see what happens. And then, you know, you, you, you just, and the, the doctrinal controversy comes up, and well, I, I really didn't want to teach people about that doctrine, and because I know it's just a role of man and woman, the fellowship um, principles and their application that just, just gets people upset. And then pretty soon there's an uproar in the congregation. Why? Because you didn't teach them in the first place, and so now you, now you head for the hills. You hide out, or you compromise, or you <coughs> equivocate. Um, and along comes and along comes somebody who, who never uh, came to church. Remember that too from my first congregation. That story turned out relatively better than I expected. Uncle Joe died, and Uncle Joe never came to church. He lived right in town too. He just was stones throw away from the church. And he died, and he, he uh, his relatives all were members, and some very very good members, and so the whole tribe came over to the parsonage. Um, and said they wanted me to bury Uncle Joe. Well, uh, I, I can't bury Uncle Joe. Well, why not? Because well, there was no confession of faith there. There was, a, quite to the contrary, a confession of, of unbelief. He didn't want anything to do with this church and what this church teaches. But he always wanted to be buried from Zion and Acasta. Well, maybe, but it's not going to happen. And um, went on to tell them a little bit further why it wasn't going to happen. And... Uh, uh, I just tickled pink when the whole tribe, I spent 10, 15 relatives, uh, when they went trooping out of, the, out of the door, the patriarch of the family who was just a really fine Christian man. I heard him say to the rest of them, see, I told you it wasn't going to make any difference if we all came. <laughs> um, or or uh, one of my own relatives uh, uh, died and uh, never, never went to church. Father decided he ought to be buried by the with, by the Missouri Synod pastor in town, and he came home all in a huff. This was when I was in high school. Um, he came home all in a huff that the pastor wouldn't bury his uncle, and um, and uh, had to be buried by burying Sam over at the Methodist church because Lutheran pastor wouldn't bury him. And I said, "Well, uh, why didn't you ask the Masons to bury him?" And he said. Duh. What kind of nonsense is that? He was never a Mason. Why should the Masons bury him? I said, he's never a Lutheran either. <laughs> uh, I won't tell you what his answer to that was. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, um, what was the point? There was a point there, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, you end up doing you end up doing just the easy things, and paving the way for disaster. Paving the way for disaster because you didn't love the scriptures enough to spend time with them just for you, and then didn't teach your people to love them either. But again, settle for professionalism and cliches. The gospel will still accomplish its saving work, but it will be hindered in some by the coldness of the shepherd. Sermons that should edify merely repeat the same things in the same way over and over again. Zeelzorga falls off because members suspect that the pastor either doesn't really care or doesn't really know them or the mind of God all that well. Um, so uh, that's some, some, some suggestions made that with the recognition that a devotional life is a very personal thing that one learns to do by doing. Um, one of the things I didn't put down in the outline that occurred to me this morning when I was looking through it is uh, one pastor, I think I've told some of you this before, one pastor sent me an email, former student, really fine man, sent me an email and said he was trying to conduct a, a personal devotional life, but he was endless frustration in doing it because um, he, he, even when he got up early in the morning, he'd be halfway through a thought and uh, the baby was crying or his wife said, dear, did you know? Um, or the phone rang uh, so that he never got, never got anywhere in his devotional life because of constant interrupts. So he, went, he said, well, I'll go to my office. Well, then the phone rang there too. And somebody wanted this and somebody needed that. Um, and he said he finally solved the problem. He went to church. And he would take out his Bible at church. And spend because nobody would bother him there. Well, that's not a bad thought. I mean, I never had that that problem, but I could see that that could be a big problem, and and that was a good solution for it. So you find some place and some time when you're not going to be bothered. Like I say, time when you can be alone with Jesus. You see that in the Gospels, don't you? How often Jesus says to the disciples, uh, uh, "Come away for a while and rest." What do you mean by come away for a while and rest? Lie down in a hammock? I doubt it. He was going to feed them. Yeah? The feeding of the 5,000 takes place in just such a context when he had taken the disciples away uh, to be with him alone for a while. So, read but don't be in a big hurry. I even hear this at pastoral conferences sometimes and, and now I speak up and have at it or say something before they say it. You ought to get through the Bible every year. All you got to do is read three chapters a day and you'll get through the whole of the Bible every year. What's the rush? What's the big whoopee about getting through the Bible uh, every year? I don't. <laughs> um, when you first read the Bible, if you haven't read it through, yeah, then you should get through it as quickly maybe as you can so you get the landschaft, so you get the landscape of it. And you get to see where it comes from, where it is, and where it's going. But after that, don't be in such a big hurry. Um, some of the things that, some of the books of the Bible, yeah, maybe you can read three, four, five, six chapters. Um, I don't hang on every word of Leviticus the way I do every word of the Gospels or of Paul. Um, there, that Leviticus is the word of God too. Numbers is the word of God too. And it maybe it's going to take you a lot longer to find out what eternal relevance it had, has uh, for you in the ministry. And it does have some. I'm not going to tell you what it is either. Um, figure it out for yourself. Um, don't pay me enough to tell you what that's all about. Anyway, um, uh, but when you, get to the, when you get to the Gospels, I can't read a chapter of the Gospels. Very rarely, once in a while and get through a chapter of a gospel in an hour, but it's pretty rare, pretty rare. Uh, because there's so much in each one of those chapters, it may take me three, four days to get through that chapter. Um, because again, how is this incident in the life of Jesus, how is it unique? What is there in this one story? You might have three, four stories in a chapter. What is there in this one story, in its narrow context, maybe later on I'll think of its wider context, that makes it unique, um, un that teaches you something that, that, n that no other chapter teaches in quite the same way. I I'll give you just a few examples, um, just a few examples from, from the Gospel so you see what I mean. Uh, you have in Mark 1, that's certainly a chapter I'm not going to get through in a day. 
my devotions, by the way, take me about an hour, a little bit longer in Advent and Lent. Um, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm reading Mark 1, there's that story of that leper at the end of Mark 1 that comes to Jesus and from a distance, of course, says, if you want to, if you want to, you can help me. You can heal me. What a prayer. What a perfect prayer. He lays his whole wretched condition. By the way, that's something else you want to notice when you take all the miracles of our Lord together is that he helps out only when things are worst, at their worst. When they can't get any worse, that's when he steps in. Well, that's an interesting lesson for life, isn't it? And it'll be an interesting lesson for yours in the ministry. At any rate, um, the, the leper calls out, calls out, if you want. What a prayer. If you want. He lays everything. What if he, Jesus doesn't want to? He knows he can. He doesn't say, if you can, help me. He knows he can. If you want to. What if he doesn't want to? Apparently he's ready to, to accept that. What a beautiful prayer. That's another thing you want to notice in the prayers in the Gospels, how short they are. Um, you don't need to go on and on and on. You know, sometimes a general prayer. You almost think God has Alzheimer's. Do you really have to point all these things out to him? Um, uh, this is too often the prayer is, you people ought to be thinking about this, but I'll put it in the form of a prayer. It's much more pious that way. Um, <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, you notice how, how short the prayer is and how perfect. It's one of the most perfect prayers in the Bible. If you want, you can help me. Now, Jesus knows everything. And Jesus knows that if he helps this guy, this guy is going to make a complete mess out of things. Nevertheless, Jesus is moved with compassion. And so he says, I want to be clean. And don't tell anybody. Go and show yourself to the priest. What does the guy do? This man, who in his desperation was willing to accept no from Jesus, now thinks he knows better than Jesus. And he spreads the word all over the place so that Jesus couldn't show his face publicly in that region for a time. Now just chew on that. Just chew on that. Jesus knew that's what was going to happen. That's another question to ask, by the way. If you were writing the story, that's a really good question to ask when you're reading. If you were writing the story, how would it come out? Imagine that you'd never read the story before. If you were writing the story, how would it come out? You will find that it would always have come out the opposite of the way it came out. Um, Jesus, I remember reading the Bible one day many years ago with just that question on my mind. How does Jesus, how does God generally, and Jesus especially in the Gospels, turn the tables upside down? Because he always does, always does. Um, the, the, so great is the, no, no, no I, 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 I say to Jesus many times, if you want to, <coughs> you can get me out of this mess. If you want to. And sometimes he is moved with compassion and he answers the prayer just the way I hope he would. And then I am promptly tempted to forget that it was all him. The, the, another way to put it, whenever he answers a prayer and gives you something, he runs the risk he runs the risk that you will love the gift and cherish it more than the giver. That's what happened to the leper. But nevertheless, never, isn't that an astonishing thing? Nevertheless, so amazing is his goodness that he's willing to take that risk. And then if we fall for the temptation, and even if he, and, and he certainly knew we would many times, well, he'll find a way to get our attention again. Um, he will find his way of doing what I used to do with some of you, play ping pong with your head on a blackboard um, to get your attention. Yeah? And then you will come back to him. I, yeah, I, I, 
can see. Oh, oh Lord, this time, this time won't happen. No, 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 not this time. If you get me out of this, I don't see how you can, but if you get me out of this. My whole life is a roller coaster like that. At least mine has been. Um, and I, my guess is that yours may very well be as well. So you have that Mark 5. A fascinating chapter. They all are, but I'm just, and I'm not cherry picking. I'm just, meant just almost arbitrarily, it's because it's one of my favorite chapters. In Mark 5, you've got the story of the man who was demon-possessed on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A fascinating story. You are never going to find another place in the whole Bible, as far as I know, maybe some hot shot here. Ben, you come up with a place maybe, huh? Um, uh, where, where, you'll, where you'll mind find, but I know of no place in the Bible that teaches about reason more than the story of the demons. Um, being cast out of that man on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, the devil is not capable of sound reason. He can't, he just can't do it. You notice that in every heresy, every heresy pretends to be reasonable or to answer a rational objection to the truth of the word of God. It never is. It never is. It always is ultimately irrational. You have to spend all day uh, proving the point, but I'll just trust that you take the point. Anyway, the, the, the demons ask to be cast into the pigs, lest they come into torment before the time. Well, now you think about that dogmatically. Think about that dogmatically. Is hell a place or a state of being? Yes. The demons are making an irrational request. They will always be in hell. No matter where they are, they will always be in hell. And being cast into the pigs isn't going to improve their condition one bit. Make an irrational request. And Jesus, to show their folly, grants it. So that the devils drive the pigs irrationally over the cliff into the sea. Devil is not capable of sound reason. But he has succeeded in totally infecting the people who saw the miracle so that they make an utterly irrational request. Their request is, Jesus, go away. How irrational can you be? He has just proven his power by casting devils into pigs, and now this man who couldn't be held with chains is sitting there, um, sane and whole, and they want him to go away. They ought to be scared to death to make such a request, on the one hand, rationally, and on the other hand, they ought to be eager to have him stay because of the benefit that he had done. But totally contrary to reason, they tell him to go away. What about Jesus and reason? Jesus' irrationality is always saving. He goes away. But, the man whom, out of whom he had cast the demons begs him to come along. And Jesus in his divine and saving irrationality says, no, instead, go and tell what great things God has done for you. He leaves behind an apostle to the obstinate. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Something I might want to remember as a pastor when I'm dealing with the obstinate. Huh? And then that man, out of whom the demons were cast, goes, and Jesus told them, tell everyone what God has done for you. And then the man goes and tells everyone what, hello, hello, Jesus had done for him. He got it. Nobody else did. Only this wretch, that you wouldn't have expected to spend a minute's worth of time with. He's the only one who got it. You leave a congregation, um, and the people that you thought you had served best forget about you, and somebody that you didn't think you really served all that much at all sends you every year a Christmas letter. I remember after being out of South Dakota for, I don't know, must have been 20 years, I was invited to um, preach for a Reformation Festival, I think it was, in Aberdeen which was 90 miles away from where I had served in, in South Dakota, 90 miles is around the corner. And here, and here, lo and behold, a collection of people that I had served 20 years ago showed up just because their former pastor was there. 
And I'd only been there for two years. What a thing. What an amazing thing. You know? um, uh, again, another one of those deals where God stirs his finger in his soup. But at any rate, at any rate, among them were some that I never would have thought got really all that much out of my short time there. But they were there. Um, uh, uh, well, but we're talking about Mark 5. Um, Jairus comes. Schnell, 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 schnell. My daughter is dying. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And Jesus is pressed by the crowd and he's moving along on his way and the woman with the issue of blood comes and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops. If I were writing the story, see, I, 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 these incidents in Mark 5 are good examples of how if we were writing the story they'd come out very differently. Um, if I were writing the story, I would, I would say, well, she touched me and thus and such happened. We can let it go because we're in a hurry. After all, this is Jairus, the leader of the shul, and there are points to be made. So we'll just let it, let it pass. Oh, not Jesus. He always has time for the individual that nobody else has time for. And it, what's his first word to her? Figater. Figater. Why, did she get chills up and down her spine when he called her daughter? She had been unclean all those years. And Jesus calls her daughter, doubtless older than he was. Um, and he takes the time, he takes the time to, to encounter her just exactly where she is and to give her just exactly what she needs. The care and attention of Jesus for the individual. When there are a lot of other things to do. When he's really busy. He's beautiful. One of the attributes of God is that he is imminent. Wherever God is, he is totally, not in fractions. And so when you spend time with him, in your devotions and in your prayers, you don't have, there are, what are there, four billion people on earth now? Um, you don't have four billionth, one four billionth of his attention, minus however much attention he has to pay to the astronauts out in space and the rotation of the planets and the movement of the tectonic plates and who knows not all what else. No, you have his undivided attention. It is as though there was no one else in the world but you and him. That's what you learn from Jesus dealing with that figater. And then he goes up and he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. So you see his, his attention to the individual. And he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, and that's all nice. And then the last verse of the story, what is it? Give her something to eat. Give her something. He didn't need to say that. Wouldn't her parents have figured that out on their own without any help from him? Of course they would have. His attention to the smallest detail of my life. You know, nothing <laughs> escapes his notice, his care, his concern, even the thing that I consider trivial. Um, it's just one thing after another. There's just no end to it. Parables, when you're reading a parable. Now I know you spend some, do you still spend time at seminary on the tertium, uh, interpreting parables? You can push the tertium too far. Um, and like anything else. You're reading a parable. A parable is always a snapshot of human existence in a moment. It captures, it captures your existence in a moment, your, the whole of your existence in a moment. Um, take the paradigm parable. Sower went out to sow his seed. Some fell on this ground, some fell on that, some on the other, some on good. Okay, uh, I found the tertium. It's uh, talking about the good ground, and obviously that's me. Um, so uh, we'll, be real, we'll be real grateful for that now. And you preach that in your sermon too. Uh, be, be good ground, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and um, and uh, we'll move right on. Well, not so fast. You read it the second time. What was the epistle lesson last Sunday? I don't remember. Was that seed that fell on stony ground that the birds came and snatched away? Um, well, and now there's this problem. 
And uh, all of a sudden, I found out that I should have listened when they told me that my financial health wasn't good just because I paid the minimum of my credit card balance, and now I'm drowning in debt that I don't see how I can get out of. The cares and riches, deceitfulness, Jesus says, the deceitfulness of riches choke the seed so that it brings no fruit. And I'm a fretting and a worrying and a stewing, and, and the deceitfulness of riches got me into this mess in the first place. Some of the seed falling on thorny ground. You read it again. Um, could spend more time, obviously, on these different parts, but at any rate, you read it again. And some of it fell on good ground, and it bore fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Why? 30 and some, 60 and another, 100 and still others. What? How much fruit in me? I had to think about that. Is there more fruit than there was the last time I read the parable? Is there a connection between the fruit and the mix of soils on which the seed fell? How has that changed since the last time I read it and why? Um, so from the paradigm of parables down to those little one verse parables, a woman, or two verse parables, a woman took the leaven and and put it in the dough and, and the yeast spread and grew until the whole of the lump of dough was leavened. And that's the way the gospel is. That's the way the word of the Lord is. That's the way the kingdom of God grows. Well, where, how far is that leaven gone? Is it in my hands? Is it in my eyes? Is it in what I hear? Is it in what my heart delights in that nobody else knows about? And where is that in comparison to where it was the last time I read the parable? It just simply, you know, um, when I was in high school, I told some of you this before, when I was in high school, we, we would be badgered all the time, every sermon, now every sermon has, and be sure you share this message with your neighbor. Um, no matter what the text is, that's the application. Um, and, and, and in my day, it was no matter what the text is, and go home and read the Bible. And so I felt guilty about that I hadn't done that. Yeah, I was must about 16, 17 years old. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to go home and read the Bible and get them off my back. I'll read the Bible and I'll be done with it. Um, I really like to read something twice. Well, that was over 50 years ago. And I'm not done yet. Um, because there's always something that you didn't see before. I don't care what it is you're reading. Even as you age, even as you age, you look at certain parts of the Bible differently than you were young. I remember um, one time when I was reading about, in the Old Testament, all the provisions that David made for the building of the temple. And it occurred to me, I started thinking about that. Um, was David, I don't know if he was or not, but the question came to mind, was David trying to preserve orthodoxy from the grave? He was going to have it all perfect when he died. So that all Solomon had to do was step into it and the golden age of the true worship of the true God in the true temple would begin. Did he think about that? Did that thought cross his mind? I don't know. Eh, so much of preaching and teaching, trying to save the church for tomorrow? Um teach future pastors and and you hope when you're dead they'll be orthodox and and you will preserve the faith of the church from the grave because you learned them good you taught them to love jesus and his word and his people and so now the church is all set and then you get old and you find out that the problems that you're going to face are not the same as the problems that i faced i was well trained for the problems that i faced Hopefully you've been well trained for the problems you're going to face, but you're going to have to face them. The orthodoxy of the church, St. Jude said it all, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's a never done deal. And each generation has to win that orthodoxy uh, for itself. And it does it, it does it by fidelity and love for the scriptures and not apart from it. Um, so, so, anyway, um, there's always, uh, read, learn, inwardly digest. There's always something to chew on. Don't be in any big hurry um, when you read the Bible. Learn to ask questions of the text. I mentioned that already. Um, um, 
What does this section have to say, especially to me in my particular Zitzim Leben, as a mere sinner, as a husband and father, as a pastor? If I had never seen this story before, how would I have written an end to it compared to the way it really does end? And what does that tell me of God's incomprehensible grace and mercy? If God, if Jesus dealt with this person, these people this way, how should I expect him to deal with me? A question especially useful in reading Old Testament Bible history. Um, where, by the way, the Orthodox Lutheran fathers are in the habit of finding, we don't do that anymore. I don't know if that's good, bad, or indifferent. We just don't do it anymore. But the um, Orthodox Lutheran fathers from the 17th century found types of Christ every time they swung a dead cat around. Um, there wasn't anything in there that wasn't the type of Christ. Um, Gerhardt, I think some of you, you know my book of Gerhardt's sermons. I'm back at them again. I have 1,600 pages of Gerhardt's sermons. There are some students who want to be the first to know when I die um, so they can get that book because uh, it's a masterpiece. You, Chris, want to know the first one? Um, uh, Gerhardt, as soon as he, when he has a gospel text, when you're reach, reading his gospel pericopes, he always starts it out with an Old Testament type of Christ, with an Old Testament story that matches up. Um, a lot of good reasons to do that. But at any rate, uh, at any rate, um, always stuff there. Uh, and you're never done. St. Paul says that the angels desire to peer into the mystery of the incarnation. If the angels are never finished meditating on the incarnation, you really think that you're ever going to be? Uh, and, and if you think you are, obviously, you, you've missed most of the boat. It done sailed and you're left with a leaky kayak. Um, always, there's always more. There's always more. Uh, what makes the story unique? Why, of all the other things that could have been recorded, did the Holy Spirit choose to have this recorded? Um, John 20, many other things Jesus did, but these are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, believing have life through his name. 2 Timothy 3.16, Pantagraphe, yeah. All scripture given by inspiration of God, and then St. Paul's example of the proper use of Old Testament history in 1 Corinthians 10. Benefits that far outweigh the obstacles, should be obvious. Most obviously, the benefit of private devotional life is for yourself. You will discover that the beauty of God's grace grows and grows year by year, that his word is never old, that you will never come close to exhausting the depth and the riches of the mind of God. For your preaching and teaching, you will have a set pattern of seeking the specific in texts and never become satisfied with the generic and the cliché to come full circle from what I began with, that, will, uh, that that will enrich those you serve will in time become ever more evident to them and to you as well. The same questions that you ask of a text every day, you will ask of it when you prepare sermons, Bible classes, hospital, and shut-in devotions. As the well gets deeper, so too will the water that comes from it become ever sweeter and richer. Um, I could stop here if you want to. Oh dear, it's time to say amen. Um, I'll, I'll make. Uh, 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 not, not say amen. Finish? Should I finish? I'll go fast. I won't, I won't editorialize. An example offered with some reluctance, both because it's very personal, because its author does not want to be considered an authority, setting down the right way that you should do it. Aber doch, and since you asked for it, it's the way I do it. Nomine Patri, et Fini, et Spiritu Sancti. Benedictus Deus in omnibus doni suis. The prayer is a prayer that Luther learned in his monastery days, the prayer that a monk was to utter whenever someone gave him something while he was begging. I like it because it starts, and that for me is after I've read, after I've read, um, then I do um, matins or compline, uh, matins or prime. Uh, uh, but always after I, this, this before I read, but matins after I read. This, uh, I don't know about you, uh, I had classmates who woke up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, really irritating people. Um, <laughs> I, I always wake up grumpy and crabby, and I think of all of the reasons why I really don't want to get up, uh, oh, that strikes a chord, does it? Um, and I, I re I, this, there's going to be this irritation and that aggravation and, and this bother and that bother, and I don't really want to bother with any of it. Um, the, the, beginning of the, the beginning of the morning devotion, Benedictus Deus Nomnibus Doni Suis, I, I chew on that just for, a, just for a while and try to think of things, it's never difficult either, 
of things to be grateful for that I wasn't grateful for yesterday. Something new or something that I haven't thought of in a while. The goal always being to get your attention focused on what really matters. Yeah. And to sweep away all the rubble and the rubbish and the nonsense that you thought was important when you got out of bed. Um, so anyway, I call to mind some blessings that I haven't thought of, thought about before or for a while that God has given to this beggar. It's a good way of starting to clear the clutter from the brain, all the things I think I have to complain about and be grumpy about or worry about. And then this from the old hymnal, I'm not real pleased with the translation of it in the new hymnal, I like it much better. Lord, open thou, again, clearing away the rubble. Lord, open thou my heart to hear, and through thy word to me draw near. Let me thy word e'er pure retain. Let me thy child and heir remain. And then that second verse, thy word doth deeply move. Yeah, that's a good pastor's prayer. Good anybody's, but especially pastors. Thy word doth deeply move the heart. Thy word doth perfect health impart. Thy word, my soul, that's what it all is in the gospel. All the things that are going to ring your chimes and make you happy, it's all focus, 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 focus on Christ in the scriptures. Um, thy word, my soul, with joy doth bless. Not my success in the ministry, but thy word. Thy word brings peace and happiness. Not when everybody likes me, but the word to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, three in one, be endless glory as before the world be. That's what it's all about. Um, the glory of God, not the glory of me. Not getting rid of all the things that bother me. Um, I especially like this prayer before I begin to read the Bible because as with Luther's Benedictus Deus, it helps put things in perspective. All the things that I by myself consider so important that I look to for pleasure or satisfaction, even the good but lesser blessings of family and friends, of earthly wealth and comfort, are dim next to the total satisfaction to be found alone in Christ, the center of the word, who has found me in it and wants to make himself the center of my life and work. Likewise, all the things that I think I have reason to complain about are reduced to trivial, this is just, this, this good stuff, boys, and reduced to trivial bits of self-centeredness for which I have more reason to repent than to complain. The word, I read only as much as I can digest in this hour, too much scatters my thought and attention and diminishes my wonder and gratitude for the blessings to be found there. I might read five or six pages of some parts of the Bible, but only part of a chapter in another. I usually pick a volume from my library of German sermons. Um, at the beginning of in Advent, I pick one and work through it. Um, sermons, and on Monday, read the one for that week. I appreciate the insights that my betters have gleaned from text, and it certainly keeps me from ever thinking that I have finished with a text. I'd say a word about the confessions and the wisdom books. Um, anybody who thinks he's going to read six chapters of Proverbs because that's what he's assigned to himself for that day is an absolute fool, is a total blooming idiot. Um, he may get this or that out of it, but he's going to miss most of it. Uh, the first ten chapters, you can maybe read two chapters at a swoop, but after you get to chapter 11, one chapter is good and plenty. I read the wisdom books in conjunction with the Gospels. Um, I happen to be in the Gospel of Matthew now, and so I've been, was back at Proverbs. And it's interesting, it's just fascinating to see how beautifully the scriptures interlace and intertwine their thoughts. Um, again, just by way of example, because it's fresh in my mind, I, I was reading on Tuesday uh, Proverbs 11 and the second half of Matthew 5. And Proverbs 11 talks about a lot about the path of the righteous and the life of the righteous. And then, and, that, and that's good stuff. That's really good stuff. And contrast it with the way of the wicked, as so much of Proverbs does. And then the end of the second half of Matthew 5 um, talks about, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, isn't that an interesting interconnection there? Um, as hard as I will strive to lead a righteous life, it is only a righteous life if it is wrapped in the righteousness of Christ uh, because my own righteousness isn't going to make it. So you have something to chew on there. And then it just so happens that we're in the week of Utica, the fifth week of Lent, Passion Week, and this is how much it costs Christ to bring me that righteousness. 
You think you could think about that for 15, 20 minutes profitably? Uh, I, I suspect you could. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find when you do things like that um, how beautifully the scriptures interweave together and how one thought begets another that's closely connected and inseparable. Um, the other thing I do when I read the Gospels is read the confessions. You ought to read the confessions every year. Uh, and so I'll pick some part from the, from the confessions that I'll read in conjunction with the short snippet from the Gospels that I've read, that I've read for that day. Because the confessions, like I always say, are so Lutheran. Um, and, and, and you think that's funny. And it's not, it's the truth. They really are Lutheran. And, and you're going to stumble up against so much in your ministry that isn't. Um, your members are listening to Christian radio. Uh, and you found a really neat book on counseling by who knows who from Erdman's. And uh, no gospel in it. Good, good application of the law. That's it, fine. Uh, but no gospel. Won't. You're going you're gonna to read so much that, that isn't Lutheran. Read the confessions. They're so Lutheran. Um, delightfully so. Um, so anyway, then after that, as I say, I say matins are prime. The other minor liturgies in the hymnal would do just as well, but these are what I've used for over 50 years, and I've seen no reason to go to something else just for the sake of variety, but that's just me. A um, couple of observations about the prayers. The Venite, I love the Venite. Uh, o come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. It's gospel. It's beautiful gospel in that first verse. Yeah, I want to do that because he's, I want to sing to the Lord because he's the rock of our salvation. Um, and then it, goes, then it goes to God's attribute of omnipotence. The sea is his and he made it. And so forth. And then it, comes, then, it, then it comes to, so let's kneel before the Lord our maker. Yeah, I think I better because the sea is his and he made it. Um, and he's all powerful. And why do people kneel? Why do people kneel uh, before a monarch? They kneel before a, you kneel before a monarch or a potentate so that you can't kill him. Uh, he can kill you, but you can't kill him. He can hit you, but you can't hit him. You kneel because you're in a completely vulnerable position in the presence of power that's greater than yours. But how does the venite end? For we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. What? <laughs> Knock your socks off. Um, that's why you kneel. Not so much because he's omnipotent, but because he's going to feed you by hand. Like a little lamb. Isn't that nice? Um, uh, e even in the early part of, the, of, of Matins, and, and I think Vespers too, uh, make haste, make haste, O God, to deliver, make haste to help me, O Lord. Snow, 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 snow. Because if you don't help me in this very instance, I'm done for. Again, it's a matter of putting things into perspective. Uh, um, works that way. Um, the Vene, I just love that. Um, the Psalms, I love the Bible's hymnal, except during Advent and Lent, when I focus on the Psalm for the week, especially in Lent, most of the introits, we don't do introits anymore, it's kind of too bad. Um, love those introits. Um, the Latin names, the, the 12 Latin Sundays, the 6th of Lent and the 6th of Easter, preached a series of sermons on that one year. They're beautiful. Uh, so I'll focus on, especially on the psalm, on the psalm for that week, because they're all prayers of Christ and his passion. That's another neat thing about the psalms. When you get to psalms that are primarily uh, um, messianic, as, th as those psalms are for Lent in the main, it's interesting that, that the psalm is primarily Jesus' prayer. But because of what he did in his passion, it's legitimately my prayer too. Um, Eureka meo domine. Judge me, O God, and plead, what is that, fifth, Psalm 53? Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. It's Jesus' prayer and his passion, but it becomes my prayer because of what he did. Reminiscere, O Domine, misericordias tuam. Um, second week in Lent, in Vocavit. Uh, all of them. Laitari, the fourth son. Well, anyway, um, my time is up, so I'm going to go shall, shall, shall. Um, hymn, as with the reading, so with the hymn, I sing through the <coughs> German hymnal, uh, in step with the seasons of the liturgical year, including the minor festivals and the saints' days, the Te Deum or the Benedictus, Benedictus, of course, in Advent and Lent, um, Benedictus especially. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a good thing that Zacharias wasn't writing that for the publishing house, uh, because you can't have a sentence that's more than 14 words 
and um, Zacharias never would have made it um, if he had depended on the publishing house. Then they're they're just wonderful. They don't treat me badly. But I remember, I remember when they first told me I could only have sentences that were 14. That's that's not even a respectable dependent clause in German. <laughs> Uh, I've come to the conclusion over the years that they were right, but the Benedictus is wheels is wheels inside of wheels. Ezekiel could have written it. It takes years. It, I think anyway. Maybe you're smarter than I am. I no doubt some of you are. Some of you. Uh, <laughs> um, no, also not you. Uh, <laughs> um, it takes years takes years to get to the bottom of the Benedictus as, as, as to I, I mean when I when I sing the Benedictus I, I really have to re-chop it up to get the antecedents right um, in those various clauses of the Benedictus but at any rate again these great liturgical hymns focus my attention on what is most important in worship namely God's gift in the gospel and what I want to be most important in my life Jesus who in grace is the source of it all the Lord's Prayer well if I had more time I'd spend more time on the Lord's Prayer, but that, again, is, is a well you never get to the bottom of. There's ample opportunity in praying the Savior's Prayer to think about the specific application of what I have read today and the specific needs and concerns that I have to lay at the Father's feet before Christ, before his throne of grace. And then as the end of all, whenever I'm in church or whenever I'm worshiping alone, I always pray at the close, the Adoramus Dei Christi, or one of the, there no, there's more than one form of it, and I alter them. Aramus te Christi et benedicimus tibi quia per sanctam crucem tuam redimis di mundum qui passus est pro nobis o domini miserere nobis et domini nobis pacem. It's a form that I pray in Lent. Um, so, I'm done. The Lord's Prayer. Uh, again, it, it, I used to when I, was, when I was your age, I wondered why the Lord's Prayer was in the Catechism, because it doesn't seem to measure up and wait to the Ten Commandments and the Sacraments and the Creed. And then one year, uh, I wrote a series of sermons in Lent for the Wednesdays in Lent, Our Lord's Prayer and Our Lord's Passion. And that was a, and a good grief. I must have been in my middle 30s before I realized, began to realize, never done with it, before I began to realize the incomparable beauty of that prayer. Um, in it, the Christian comes as such a beggar and delights, just simply delights, to make himself totally dependent on God and not at all dependent on himself. It's so obvious in the opening petitions uh, uh, give us this day our daily sauerbraten, schnitzel, leberknödel suppe, vichyssoise, bread. Give me what I need. Um, and then, like I always say, isn't it interesting? If we were writing that prayer, we would have put forgive us our trespasses first. Jesus puts it Luther catches it in a way. It, the kingdom of God and God's will uh, and God's name are hallowed in and of themselves. God, uh, and, he, and he hallows it among us and his kingdom comes among us and so on when his word is preached in his truth and purity and we lead a godly life according to it. He, he promises to do all those things, those enormous things. We never, Luther makes such a point of that in the large catechism. We don't come asking God for small things. We ask him for enormous things in that prayer. And he promises to give them to us all and then give us this day our daily bread, even what I need um, to sustain body and life and family and the state and civil society and so on. All of that he promises to give me. Well, what excuse could you possibly have for sin? After all, you sin because the kingdom of God hasn't come yet fully. Because his name yet isn't in you, completely hallowed his will, in you, completely done. But if he gives all these things so richly in his word, you shouldn't have to ask for forgiveness. Uh, well, well, you, you sin by worrying about the lack of daily bread and all that the term means in, the, in that prayer. 
But why, why would you want to worry about that? Jesus told you to ask for those things, and the very fact that he's the one who told you to ask assures that God will give them. So wh why, are, why are you scratching and clamming, cl uh, clamoring and clawing and belly aching about your lack of this and your lack of that? He gave you what you needed. You don't have any reason to complain, but you do. And it's another one of those things where Jesus knows us so well, and it's just amazing that he still puts up with you. I, People think worship is boring. You ought, to, you ought to give some thought to, why isn't God bored? He ought to be bored. Um, here he gives you all these things and takes away every possible excuse for, uh, for sinning, and, and then he says, ask me for forgiveness, because I know you're going to make a mess of the whole thing. And then, somebody ought to write a careful study of lead us not into temptation. Even that is the little child saying, oh God, I put it all on you. Uh, because if left to myself, I will run headlong over the cliff with those demons cast into the pigs. So I put it all on you, God. You have to see to it that that doesn't happen. Even in, even in, even in forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I said, great pains to say that our forgiveness is not the cause of his. But you want to give some thought to that. In that prayer, basically you are saying to God, oh God, take me as an example. <coughs> Don't you find that rather jarring? In point of fact, oh God, we do forgive. We cannot survive in our humanity even in our fallen condition, if we do not forgive spouse, children, parents, friends, neighbors, and so forth and so on. To some extent, we do forgive. But you, O oh God, you forgive in a divine way. Follow my human stumbling, faltering example in your divine way. Forgive as only you can. Um, isn't that neat? Anyway, there's just no end to that prayer. Um, and then, for thine is, uh, thine is das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit und Ewigkeit, um, as we say in the original. Um, I don't know if that's canonical or not. And frankly, I don't much care. It, it's a perfect end to that prayer. Again, I lay it all up to you, God. These enormous petitions that cover my whole life down to the smallest detail. It's all up to you. Well, anyway, again, um, I'm done. Do you have any question or comment that I hope I didn't? Like I said, I was kind of reluctant to do this, but you ask, so. How do you decide what you're going to read? Do you have to schedule Yeah, it? yeah, pretty much. Um, usually in Advent, I start out with the major prophets. Um, and then, and then, however long that takes me, when I'm through with the major prophets, then I start with with Matthew, and as I say, I'll read the wisdom books uh, um, along with Matthew, and that's usually going on during Lent, so it works well. And then after Matthew, um, usually, probably late in Easter, I'll, I'll read um, uh, Hebrews and James because those were written really sort of kind of like in conjunction. Matthew is the, is the book that's written to the Jewish Christians. And so Hebrews and James seem like good matches for that. And then it depends. Uh, it depends. Um, I, when I read Mark, uh, I'll be in the Confessions. And uh, after Mark, I'll read um, Paul, Pauline Epistles, read Luke and Acts together. And then these are the Gospels. Well, it depends on how it strikes me that year. I'll go back to the Old Testament to maybe read the historical books of the Old Testament um, uh, or the Pentateuch. I don't think in a given year I would ever read both the Pentateuch and the historical books in the same year. I doubt if I'd ever get to that. And then John, of course, John's epistles and Revelation. And usually by that time it's the end of the year. So that's the kind of the cycle that I, that I follow. Sometimes I'll divvy up. The, depends on how fast I'm going uh, for whatever reason. Um, 
maybe I'll divvy up the historical books into two sections, read a gospel, and come back and read the second half of the historical books. But always the prophets and always the gospels. That's just the way I do it. I mean, I'm not saying that's the way to do it. That's just the way I do it. Anything else? You mentioned <clears throat> when you read, you're not in a hurry. Yeah. I, I found myself doing the opposite, um, thinking that the more times I can get through the Bible, the better grasp no. I'll have of the sweep of it and know, know it better. I don't believe it. Um, I guess... Two. As, two. as you're chewing, though, do you... I mean, do you just sit there and chew? Do you page through? And no, I sit there and chew. Um... This doesn't have to be a laborious or really a long time consuming thing. Again, it depends what I'm reading. You know, we're in the middle of the passion history. I any given part of the passion history is going to keep you busy for the rest of your life, and I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry. Um, Jesus tells the soldiers in Gethsemane, Take me and let these go. Where did that ever happen before? That the prisoner tells the soldiers who's coming and who's going. Oh. Um, Friend, hetaira, Matthew's Gospel. Hetaira, friend, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Where it's only used three times in the Gospels. And it's always somebody who has betrayed the friendship, who has been unfaithful to the friendship. Jesus yearning, yearning to reclaim Judas. Why am I like Judas? I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. It's just no, there's just, there's just no end to it. And like I say, with the stories in the Gospels, the thing I, I mean, do what you want, obviously, but, but, but the thing I worry about, again, is that, you know, well, I did it now, I, I did my thing, I read the Bible and, and, and this year, and, 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 it, and you never dig a deeper trench. It always just remains general and generic instead of specific and unique. Like I say, if you ask those questions, how is this, how is this story unique? Um, how does it find me as a pastor, as a husband, as a father? Why was this written? And, and of all the things that could have been, why did the Holy Ghost pick this? It'll keep you busy chewing for a while. And after a while, at least, again, I'm just speaking from my own perspective. You do what you want. Um, it, it becomes a hobby to us. It becomes something that's rather automatic. Y you find, I'm sure if, if you haven't yet, you will, you find that the devil is busy while you're thinking. As you look at your watch and say, when am I going to get, well, I'm almost done with this, now I can get onto something, I've got this and this and this to do. You find that happens. I'm going to chew a little bit harder. So like I say, that's just, that's just me. It's just, too, it's just too delightful. You know, if you've got, if you've got a nice, if you've got a nice uh, shalm tort there, you inhale it, uh, you, know, you want to savor it. I want to savor that shalm tart. Um, yeah? You go swimming in labor canola zuppa? No, oh, it's a spoon at a time. Yeah? Uh, do you swill a good tea? Come to my house, have good tea. Had good tea at my house, not? Ben, do you have good tea at my house? Yeah. Not you, Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Who loves you besides Jesus, Mary, and Joseph? <laughs> Any, anything else? Yes. You know, other, one of the things people like to do is have study time on their own. And I've been looking at Christian study time as pastor. I was wondering, do study and meditation, do you see those as two different things, two different goals? Are they the same? Do they overlap? Or do you yeah, there's, the, the, the answer to, is yes to all of them. I mean, they, certainly when you're writing a sermon, you apply the text first to yourself. In your devotions, you apply it just to yourself, or at least that's your primary aim. The difficulty, it seems to me, if you don't have a private devotional life, is that when you're writing a sermon um, for other people, you be too quick in the application that's unique to you. But that will also always be there. So yeah, there's, there's some overlap. But it seems to me that if the, if the devotional life is rich, the study time will be richer. Um, and again, it won't as quickly decline into the generic and the cliche. Um, I've, maybe I've told this story before too, that somebody asked Professor Plitzewite 
um, one time about a certain preacher in our synod who had a reputation of being a good preacher. And um, Professor Plitzowite knew the man, and so the students said, why, wh why is he such a, what accounts for the fact that he's such a good preacher? And Plitzowite's answer was instantaneous. He has a rich devotional life. And I think he, he hit the nail on the head. So yeah, there's 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 overlap, but um, you do do both because in a way, when you're studying to prepare, you you really are your attention is divided, and and probably two thirds of it is on the people, or probably ought to be, on the people that you're preparing this for. But your needs are the same, only different. Anything else? Well, it's warm and stuffy down here, but I don't think I lost too many of you. Um, oh, I appreciate your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.